Hello and welcome to Pro Beauty Talks, a podcast about the people, the products, and the companies that make up the professional beauty industry. I'm Melanie Kopakin, the creator, co-producer, and host of the show. This is where creativity is embraced, while at the same time, we recognize that this is a multi-billion dollar industry that is big business. Greg Gilmore is a native of Cleveland, Ohio. He has spent more than 15 years mastering the art of hair. He's developed into a very unique, talented, and comprehensive hair master, possessing a true passion for the beauty industry and hair care. At the early age of 16, Greg began assisting and shampooing in local salons. He was eager to get a jump start on his peers by learning everything he could about hair prior to graduating from cosmetology school in 2004. Greg Gilmore's years of concentration in haircuts and color services has made him one of Los Angeles's top haircut experts and colorists specializing in textured hair. Today, Greg has continued to invest in himself by taking additional educational courses in color theory from Paul Mitchell, a L'Oreal professional, as well as acquiring a diploma from the Del Sassoon Academy for Advanced Haircuts. He is the epitome of an individual who understands the importance of continuous education. Greg was named one of Cleveland's top 50 hairdressers by Blow Magazine in 2008 and 2009. He was featured as a platform artist at the 2011 Spectrum Beauty Expo in Los Angeles. He was also featured as a platform artist at the 2016 Bonner Brothers International Beauty Show and has worked basically, gosh, on so many, many networks such as NBC and Fox and CBS. And uh, he currently is an associate artist educator representing one of the world's leading texture brands, Design Essentials. Now, Greg provides product knowledge and speaking engagements all through the U.S. And he was also named Designer Essentials Artistic Educator of the Year in 2018. He's done so much great work. I can't even begin to recite all of his honors and all of the opportunities that he's had to work with celebs all over the world, let alone Hollywood. Those who've worked with Greg would say that he is an excellent conversationalist, and clients affirm that he is the greatest at what he does. He's a trendsetter, all right, and he has unbelievable ability to transform hair and art. His life's mission is to touch people's lives in a positive way. He has tremendous focus, and he has an ability to make a difference in the world, however big or small, and to encourage positive progression towards a better tomorrow, one head at a time. I really enjoyed working with Greg, talking to him, getting to know him. He has a beautiful voice. He's very articulate and authentic. I learned a lot from him in this podcast, and I learned a lot about the importance of having goals and sticking to your dreams. Please welcome my guest, extraordinary hairdresser, Greg Gilmore. Hello, Greg. Welcome to Pro Beauty Talks. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> hey, I'm good. I have to say, I'm so excited to hear that you're in Baton Rouge today. Yes, I am. I was out here teaching some classes for Hattori Hanzo. They went really well, so I'm just kind of waiting to catch my flight later on and joining you. <laughs> well, I have had to catch you on the fly a couple of times. I think the last time you were at, at baggage claim at LAX, yes. <laughs> we were trying to have our call. So, you know, that's just what we do, right? Mm -hmm. It is yeah. you're constantly moving and it's so exciting. And what kind of things were you teaching our great industry yesterday? Well, of course, I'm teaching the wonderful art of hair cutting, which is uh, my passion, my favorite thing to do in hair. And just going over a little bit of philosophy, sharing my experience, things that I've learned over the years being in the industry. And I just like lighting other cosmetologists' fires because, you know, we get so humdrum sometimes. So um, it's really gratifying to just kind of see them light up and learn things. But that's what I was teaching. 
Awesome. I really love your attitude. It is so empowering, and I'm so glad we got to meet and have this opportunity together. I kind of think you're the hairdresser's hairdresser, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But first, before we get too deep into that, I really want to know more about you and how you got into the beauty business. That's a great question. But, you know, I get that question all the time, especially when I'm in classes. I've always been fond of hair. You know, I thought hair was really amazing just because it can be cut short. It could be long. It can say a lot of things about the person. But at an early age, I actually used to play in my grandmother's hair when I was probably around six or seven. And um, she probably allowed me to play on her hair because she would be falling asleep. And so that was a way for her to keep her eye on me <laughs> as a child. But I think that introduced me into, you know, kind of like um, the play of hair, like playing in hair. And then um, my aunt owned a salon. And so when I was about 13, 14, I would always go up to the salon also accompanying my mother because she had to get her hair done. And she was a single mom. She couldn't really afford to get, you know, a babysitter for me all the time. And I was pretty, you know, active and liked to participate in things with her. So I would go to the salon with her and I was just very intrigued by the atmosphere, the other cosmetologists, how they would go about creating stuff on people's heads. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. the person would go out and wear that, you know, and then they got paid the same day. Of course, that was nice. But I just liked the camaraderie in the salon, the chance to talk and have conversation while creating. And so then once I was in high school, I actually had an opportunity to take cosmetology in my high school, which they don't really have a lot of those programs anymore. No. Like they used to, yeah. Yeah, I really am an advocate of those programs. It's too bad that we don't have them because I think that really started people out on a really good foot, you know, yes. with a career. I think so, too. It definitely helped me because, you know, my parents kind of scared me to death saying that, you know, the world is hard and, you know, you got to be prepared. And so Get I was tough. Scared, right? <laughs> <laughs> Toughen so, up. <laughs> yeah. And I was just really nervous about being able to be independent and take care of myself. And so that I was drawn to that in high school. And so I took the program. And so upon graduation, I was able to go ahead and take my state board test and I passed the first time. And so I started working in the salon. I did a lot of apprenticeships in local salons. I also did apprenticeships while I was in school because we had a apprenticeship program. So we were able to leave school early and go to salons and just, you know, shadow other veteran stylists, see how they did hair, intake a lot of their techniques. And um, I just was very intrigued uh, very early. So I just stuck with that. And I actually have not had an, any other job besides doing hair since I was probably about 14. I had a cashier job. <laughs> wow, that's great. So where did you grow up, Greg? I am originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. So I'm kind of country. <laughs> I have some country in there, which is a little bit There are people from, who would argue that that's not country. Yet. I know. <laughs> I know. It's a little country outside of Cleveland. Cleveland is ah. actually more metropolitan. <laughs> it's a metropolitan city. However, there's a lot of farmland surrounding the city. And so a lot of my people, my family is from the South, too. So I still have some of that draw in me a little bit sometimes. However, I'm from Cleveland, born and raised. And then you ended up in Southern California. How'd that happen? Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I know. That's a big jump. It's a big um, jump. It's a big jump. Well, you know, I feel that my life has really been a series of jumps, honestly. And what I've learned from that is that in order to grow, you have to take those jumps and you have to at a certain point, get comfortable with taking jumps to, you know, get further along and to grow. So one of the jumps I had was moving to California. I knew that there was something more for me. I wanted to express myself more. Cleveland is a little bit conservative, you know, and so I was probably the odd man out when I did more quirky things or wore louder colors. But I knew that I would fit in in the liberal atmosphere of California. And you so you found your people. I found my you, tribe. your other people. Yeah. Your tribe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the first time I went to Venice Beach, I went there to visit and I just felt like I 
fell in love. It was artists out there. They were juggling. People were being creative and drawing on the sidewalks and just being so artistic. And so I said at that point that I wanted, that's where I wanted to live. And so I just took the leap. I drove across the country. (laughs) With Um, everything that you had, you just left? I just left. (laughs) Wow. I was extremely nervous, but I knew that I should do it while I was young. I was about 24 at the time. And I knew that, you know, it was something in my heart. It was something I was passionate about. And, you know, you read a lot of times about follow your heart, follow your dreams. And so I just took the initiative and I jumped off the high board and I did. But I sold some things. I, you know, let go of some things. Um, But I let go of some things to gain something bigger. And that's what I feel like I've done. Wow. So tell me what the hardest part of that was. Leaving my family leaving my clients because I had been doing hair for about eight years up until that point. And it was really hard telling them because some of my clients I had actually initiated their first cuts. So, you know, they kind of felt as if I may have been abandoning them a little bit. So that was hard, but I did give them really great referrals and I stayed in contact with them. And also While I was in California, the first two years, two to three years, I still frequented back to Cleveland to do my old clientele and just to make sure that they were good. Plus, you know, I needed money (laughs) because in the beginning, I didn't really make a lot of money. So I would go back to just kind of re-up on my funds and then I would come back so that I could kind of still continue making it. Mm, That's great. So I'm very curious about what made you make the leap from there? I mean, you were a hairdresser, you're building a clientele in Southern California, and you got involved in education. And you really do thrive with, you know, being able to share with others your skills, your motivation, your inspiration. Tell me about that and and how you got there. Well, you know, I think a lot of times when you're working in purpose and working in your purpose, I think it's a combination of, you know, divine timing preparation, and just your natural ability. Because I've always had a natural ability for sharing things. Anything I would learn, I loved, I had a joy in sharing that with my friends, sharing that with my clientele. And so I think it was natural for me to share things that I've learned or picked up along the way. Once I was in California, I wanted to teach, but I wasn't sure how I was going to teach. And so then I was approached to be an educator for Design Essentials by a colleague of mine who had been asked first. And he was a celebrity stylist. And um, his name is Dorico Jackson. And um, he really helped me out a lot when I first met him in California. We worked at a salon called Jasmine Ashley Salon. And he referred me for the position. And once I started, it was just a natural knack I had for it. People started to be drawn to the things that I had to say. And so then I started to get booked a lot on shows and classes. And so, you know, of course, the more you do something, the better you get at it or the better you are because practice makes perfect. So I was working so much and it was just something that I feel was meant to be because I didn't have to work really hard to sell myself. I just had to be myself. Through just being myself, I attracted a lot of those opportunities to me. That's very powerful if you really think about that. You know, I think so many people try to be who they're not. And, you know, if you are who you are, people feel that authenticity. Yes, I believe that as well. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, Oprah said it best. She said, you know, people recognize the truth. Mm. And so if you can just be authentic self, then, you know, things would be drawn to you that have to do with your purpose. Greg, you mentioned the word with a little uh, parenthesis, not parentheses, what do you call those things around it? (laughs) Uh, You know, a little, and the things in the air. Yeah. Uh Uh, Quote, unquote, celebrity stylist. And people call you a celebrity stylist. Tell me about that and what that's like. And how does that differ from doing clients that are just regular people who come through the door? Well, you know, I've always connected with the underdog because I feel like I'm the underdog. You know, I come from just pulling myself up through grit and hard work. But celebrity work is very rewarding because 
you almost feel chosen, you know, a celebrity found or seen, you know, favoring you to choose you to, you know, touch their hair or to grace them with, you know, your talent for something that everyone will see. So I've had a lot of opportunities to do that. However, celebrities can be finicky sometimes, and they don't always just stick with one stylist. Sometimes you get opportunities through just working on a job, on a set, on a film, or on a photo shoot, and you won't necessarily become that celebrity's main hairstylist all the time. They also travel, so they might have a stylist in London, or they might have a stylist in New York and in L.A. But I think, you know, having celebrity stylists, I never really tried to coin myself as a celebrity stylist because I wanted to be more known as an artist. When I work with celebrities, it's a collaborative effort that we have together with their opinions and preferences and my suggestions and creativity. And so we come up with something that's really fabulous for this point in time, but it doesn't always last forever. And so I bring, I have great joy when I work with regular clients who are just going about their daily lives and doing very important work that is not necessarily seen all the time. You can be doing, you know, the teacher who teaches your children at school, or you can be doing, you know, a lawyer who comes in and defends justice or a politician that's going to work for our rights. You know, those people aren't always as visible as celebrities, but they're just as important. And they also deserve to feel great. And so I'm always, you know, putting my best foot forward and producing, you know, something great for whoever may be sitting in my chair. But the celebrity stylist thing is something that you kind of just fall upon. If you have an opportunity to do something, then you just take it. And then after a while, you just have notches on your belt where when you look back, you say, I've done this and I've done that and I've done that. So I've just over time accumulated a lot of opportunities that, you know, people would recognize as, you know, a celebrity stylist status. However, I find pure joy in just doing what I do for people who choose me to do it. You educate all over the country, if not all over the world. And I know that you have so much to give from a creative standpoint, but also from an inspiration standpoint. And I know that this industry is very, very important to you. Greg, can you share with me a little bit and with our audience about what that means to inspire other hairdressers and how important that is to you to make sure that they're successful? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> it's a big one. I always load my questions with three oh. questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I pretty loaded. it. But it's great because, you know, and it just thank you too, because I love having an opportunity to be able to express some of these things that you don't normally get to express. I am you know, very passionate about other cosmetologists staying motivated because I know how it feels. I know how it feels to be working really hard, trying to gain a clientele. Oh, you know, I had to build a clientele twice, once in Cleveland and another time in Los Angeles. So I have to start over before. And it's not a great feeling. You know, you have to fight a lot of insecurity and you have to fight being impatient. Sometimes you want to give up. You can be so talented, but you don't feel that way if no one can see it, you know, if no one gives you the opportunity. And so my story is my testimony, you know. And so when I go into classes and I see especially young cosmetologists or cosmetologist students, they're so eager to be where I'm at or they're so eager to just be further along and because I've been there and done that, I love encouraging them and being an example to them that says that they will, you know, that you will get over that, that hump, you know, it won't last forever. We have temporary situations in our lives, you know, and we're always just moving through each part of our journey. And I love to encourage people to continue forward, to move on, because it's so hard sometimes when you have to be so self-motivating. You need someone that is going to inspire you to be great. And people have inspired me. A lot of veteran stylists 
a lot of my clients, older women, wise women, have you know spoken great things into my life. And I feel that I can only give that back to others who need it as well. And so that's why I'm so passionate about talking to young cosmetologists and talking to old ones as well, because we all can get very burnt out on our journey. And I just want to keep everyone's fire burning because what we do is still very important work because we give people confidence. We give people confidence to continue on on their daily lives and to help other people. And so that's why our work is not just a hobby. Our work is very important. We help people identify themselves and continue on in their lives. Greg, do you have a mentor that stands out in your life? I'm sure you've had many, and you mentioned a few opportunities with clients and coworkers. Is there anyone that really stands out as a person that was pivotal in your growth? Well, yes. I, As you said, <laughs> I have had a lot of great mentors in my life. But one in particular I've had, it was a woman named Jackie Montero. She was someone who really helped me when I first moved to Los Angeles. She was the owner of a salon called Eclectic, was on Wilshire, and she saw a talent in me. And she accepted me into her salon on commission. And, you know, that's a great thing because once you can't pay booth rent, you can't, you know, once you're starting off. And so it was a blessing. And one of the things that stands out that, you know, I've always kind of gone back to that helps me today is one time I was just kind of frustrated with her. And I said, you know, I should have more clients and, you know, we're not having enough walk-ins and I, how am I going to grow? And she said, well, you shouldn't be concerned with what someone or the establishment can give you all the time. You should be concerned with what you can contribute to whatever you are part of, because you should ask yourself, do you have value? And if you're in a space, if you leave, will you be missed? And that was very incredible for me because now I'm always thinking about that. You know, rather I'm working for Design Essentials, rather I'm working for Hattori Hanzo. You know, I'm thinking, do I add value to the company? Do I add value in this class? If someone comes to me, have I add value to their life, to their career? You know, and if I leave, will they miss me? You know, and so that is always a point of reference to see how I'm doing, if I should do more, if I should, you know, be putting more of my best into this because I want to be of value. And so that was a great lesson for me at a younger age. Mentorship is so important. And I think that a lot of young hairdressers struggle with thinking that that's a really hard thing to come by. But I personally have found that so many people are willing to give and to contribute to others' growth, and they want to see people thrive. If you had an opportunity to be in front of one hairdresser or a thousand of them, and I know you do this all the time because you're in front of big audiences, but really, if you were to have a one-on-one, what advice would you give a new hairdresser who is just coming into the world of beauty? Hmm. Well, I would tell them that, first off, you're in for a long journey. (laughs) And the journey is going to have ups and it's going to have downs. But through the downs, You have to keep motivated and you have to continue through those times, even when you think that you're just spinning your wheels and you are working and practicing and working and practicing and no one's seeing it and no one's, you know, noticing it. It is still very important and it is still worth something because all of that time that you're taking practicing will come in handy at the moment that you cannot see right now. And so as time goes on, you know, you'll look back in hindsight and appreciate the time that you spent practicing, continuing with consistency and using your gift to help people who, you know, are invisible or, you know, because all that experience counts. 
And all that experience helps you for the big times when you have the big opportunities. You've practiced so much that you're so prepared and you do a great job when you do get the big hit, you know. So just continue on. Know that sometimes it won't always be, you know, highlights, but when the wave is high, you ride it. And when the wave is low, you continue to ride it because that's how the industry is. It's ups and downs, but you'll always have something to add for someone else. And your life can be so much more fruitful if you continue on the journey. Craig, what do you think is the biggest challenge we have in the world of hairdressing today? Oh, the biggest challenge. Well, I'm talking overall, you know, so you're on the road a lot. You're with these mega companies and you're on stage and you're kind of in a unique position to be able to have a good perspective, I think, of what's mm -hmm. happening. What's our biggest challenge? Well, I think the biggest challenge is, you know, staying professional, keeping the level of respect for cosmetologists. I think that sometimes, you know, you, a lot of clients might have a lot of experiences with, you know, salons and they devalue the profession because they may have had bad experiences because some cosmetologists may have not had mentors and they kind of come across and do procedures unprofessionally. But one of the things that I practice and teach is that we have to continue to use proper terminology because it gives us respect in the industry. And we have to continue to learn and educate ourselves so that we can be respected and to also keep the level of standard, you know, with education, with proper terminology, with professionalism and customer service in the salon, because we want to keep the profession and the level of professionalism high. A lot of times, you know, when we make appointments or clients make appointments, you know, they can just cancel or they don't take it as serious. But then our job is just kind of mediocre or it's a hobby, you know, but it's our job to keep it, you know, professional. So it would be that. And just continuing education. I think so many stylists don't continue their education. They keep doing the same things that they feel works. And so, you know, we don't have a high standard sometimes in certain areas or demographics. And so the level of education is very important. We always need more education, I feel, for stylists to become great and to stay great. Greg, you're so creative and you're such a talented educator and platform artist. What do you do to relax? Do you ever <laughs> take time to yourself or are you just that go, go, go work guy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good question. You know, I am that go, go guy. However, I do really enjoy long drives, <laughs> believe it or not. When I get a chance, sometimes I'll take the time to, I'll schedule out a time on the book, maybe like two months in advance. And it's something that I always have to look forward to. So I'll grind, 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 because I know that I got this nice trip or something that's coming up. And when I'm on that time, you know, it's the time for me to just relax, take in nature, take in my experience, reminisce of how far I've come and enjoy my accomplishments. I tend to be, I feel a little sophisticated. So I do enjoy checking into the hotel and the perks and amenities that come from, you know, being in the Sky Club. And so I like to chill out and relax when I do those things. And I like the long drives because they help me to think. I have a nice car. And so one of the great things that I enjoy is driving. I love sports cars. I love coupes. I love just driving on long distance drive. So one time I drove up to Napa Valley from Los Angeles and it was just a beautiful, beautiful drive. And it's nothing like, you know, having a whole week off so you can just yeah. stop. Did take you go up the time. coast? Did you go up the coast? Yeah. DCH, well, of yeah. course. Okay. <laughs> I know, was, but you know, some people try to take shortcuts to get to Napa and they go, you know. Well, yeah, well, most people don't like to drive. You know, they just <laughs> right. want to get on the plane and just get there. However, I feel like it's a lot of, you know, things you can discover. I visited Hearth Castle, which is a great stop. 
in San Simeon. And I just went up the coast and I was able to stop when I wanted to and just look at the views, take pictures of flowers. I love nature. I love flowers. And so all those things inspire me. And that's like kind of like my downtime. But when I'm just working and then like I'm done working, I like to read stuff. I like to learn. I actually enjoy taking classes. So I actually will be attending Vidal Sassoon for Creative Color at the London Academy later on this month. Nice. And I just planned that ahead of time because it'll be a chance for me to get out to Europe and just kind of explore plus learn. So those are the things I really like to do. You know, it's funny. I think that that's a good reminder to all of us, no matter where we are in our careers or how many degrees we have up our arm or, or, or you mm-hmm. know, certificates under our belt that we always need to learn. We need to keep learning mm-hmm. in order to grow. Mm-hmm. Yes, I agree. Well, Greg, this has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed our time together today. Is there anything as a just a last pearl of wisdom you'd like to share with our beauty industry colleagues before we close? Hmm. Well, I would like to say that again, I just reiterate that, you know, what we're doing is very important work and I'm passionate about it. I feel that people actually identify themselves through how they wear their hair. And, you know, I could tell a lot about a person, by the way, they wear their hair, the colors they choose to put in it, if they're artistic, if they're conservative, bobs are more conservative for more organized professional women. Sometimes you have a more artistic, free-flowing, flower child type of character, and she likes to wear pink and blues in her hair. But they can't do that on their own. They need a guide. They need someone who helps them to find their sense of identity through how they wear their hair. And so what we're doing is very important work. We help people to be who they are, you know, so we don't just style hair or we're not just artists of hair, but we're actually artists of people and we help them become who they are going to be. And that's a great blessing. (laughs) Yeah, that is a great blessing. We are, in fact, that important to a person's inner beauty as well as what happens on the outside. So it's meaningful and it's not a side hustle, Greg. (laughs) Right. (laughs) This is the real deal. The real deal. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I appreciate you so much and thank you for taking time to meet with us and chat today. I know you're busy. You're going to be rushing out to catch a plane, hopefully Uh coming home back here to Cali and safe travels to you. And thanks again for being with us. Thank you, too. And I really appreciate you as well. I'm so honored to have this interview and to have my voice be heard. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm very appreciative. Oh, it is absolutely our pleasure. Thanks so much for being a part of Pro Beauty Talks. And you have a great voice, by the way. Thank you. Thank (laughs) you so much. It's good for teaching. Yeah. uh, Take care now. (laughs) All right. You too. Thank you for listening to my interview with Greg Gilmore. For more information about Greg, you can visit www.greggilmorehair.com or you can email Greg at hairbygreggilmore at gmail.com. Subscribe to Pro Beauty Talks on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and more. You can also find us at beautylaunchpad.com and probeautytalks.com, as well as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Alexa users, check out our weekly flash briefings where we bring you the latest beauty news. The opinions expressed on this podcast by the guest or host are for educational and informational purposes only and are not intended as a diagnosis, treatment, or a substitute for professional advice from your beauty service provider or health care professional. If you have a question or a suggestion for a future guest or topic, please email me at melanie at probeautytalks.com. Until then, have a beautiful day.